But there, there'll be a countdown then. Okay. Like All right. five, four, three, two, one into your live. So. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Etiola Jones, program manager for the Hurston Wright Foundation, and it is my fantastic pleasure to introduce you to a craft talk with A. Van Jordan, a part of our week-long programming for Writers Week. A. Van Jordan is the author of four collections, Rise, which won the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award, Magnolia, 2005, which was listed as one of the best books of 2005 by the London Times, Quantum Lyrics, 2007, and The Synasty, 2013, which was published with W.W. Norton Co. Jordan has been awarded a Whiting Award, the Ansel Wolf Book Award, and the Pushcart Prize. He is also a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2007, a United States Artist Fellow, and a Lannan Literary Award Fellow in Poetry. He has taught at a number of institutions, including the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, the University of Texas at Austin, where he was tenured as an associate professor at Rutgers University, Newark, where he served as a Henry Rutgers presidential professor, and at the University of Michigan, where he served as the Robert Hayden Collegiate, Collegiate Professor of English, Language and Literature, as the director of the Helen Zell Writers MFA program, and on faculty in the residential college. Please give it up from the comfort of your seats, Avan Jordan. Hey folks, am I am I on now? Yes. All right. Uh, um, I'm going to talk for uh, a few a few minutes um, uh, about time, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll get out of here before six o'clock. I know the workshops are starting then. Uh, this thing I've um, reading from is kind of long, but I've cut it down some to try to accommodate our time here. And, you know, before I get started, one thing I'll say is I have terms I'm, I'm using and throwing out, but um, for the most part, everything we're, we're talking about um, is stuff you already know. We're just putting language to it. And, you know, what I find with my writing, and I only talk about this in the workshop quite a bit, is that um, once we have a language for something and we understand how it operates, even something that we feel is um, innate in us, um, we, we have control over it and we can manage it better. So that's what this is all about. Um, so I'll give you the, the rundown here. Uh, this title, this is Synchronizing Time in the Poetics of the Harlem Renaissance and the Negritude Movement. So we're using both of those movements and kind of talking about the way time works in poetry. One of the qualities I look for in a poem, whether another's or mine, is how the poet navigates time and space within the poem. In my estimation, this is one of the more enduring qualities of poems from which I learn. I say that this is a quality I look for, but this isn't always true. Often this is a quality that more accurately surprises me in a poem, which makes the poem more attractive to me. This element of surprise should be a factor of influence for all poets. If we're not taken aback by the craft of a poem from time to time, we would grow tired of the art form. Indeed, when I think of great films or novels or paintings, they're often memorable over time as a direct result of the discovery or surprise, if you will, found in the experience of the work. We should know what would influence us because we'll soon try to determine what will influence readers which will result in robbing them of a surprise. Once braced, it's difficult to catch someone unaware. The poems of Langston Hughes and Warren Cuny from the Harlem Renaissance and the poems of Leopold Senghor and Amé Césaire and from the Negritude movement are emblematic of work in many ways targeted to, specific audience, to a specific audience and reaching far beyond it. So let me begin um, by giving some poem, talking about some poems and my journeys uh, to this uh, topic. I'm jumping around here. So um, with the presence of the United Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, and the Jamaican-born Marcus Garvey and the Pan-African efforts of W.E.B. Du Bois, certainly with the presence of Eric Walren from South America and Claude McKay from the Caribbean, uh, the immigration of Africans and Caribbeans to America and specifically to Harlem. 
certainly with the sometimes voyeuristic, sometimes worshipful, sometimes appropriating study of African art and American jazz and Negro literature by Paul Nere, Picasso, Breton, and Lorca, the writers of the Home Renaissance must have been conscious of at least a possible African and Tillian audience. But could they have predicted the words of Lepo Senghor, who went so far as to say that Claude McKay can rightfully be considered the true inventor of negritude? I speak not of the world, of the word, but of the values of negritude. Far from seeing one's blackness as inferior as inferiority, one accepts it, one lays claim to it with pride, one cultivates it lovingly, end quote. I doubt that the writers of the Harlem Renaissance expected this sort of treatment. Um, it's also, I should also note that uh, Langston Hughes was the honored guest of the uh, uh, first World Festival of Negro Arts uh, around that same time in 66. And so uh, I say here that I doubt that the writers of the Harlem Renaissance expected this sort of treatment. It's hard to imagine that that level of prescience or even arrogance being attributed to them but nonetheless, their reach was that long and sustained. What's startling though, is that poetry is so aesthetically disparate, the home Renaissance being noted for its realism and the negative movement being surrealistic often could inspire a new literary movement without the need to displace the previous movement, but to honor it. This is very different from say the influence of the Harlem Renaissance on the black arts movement. There's no need to dethrone one group to empower the next. There was a political mission to dethrone French colonialism and its threat to Africa and the Antilles. Senghor was often criticized for being too meticulous as a poet and too faithful to the iconography of his country. The accusation of uh, precocity was answered with a glossary at the end of the 1961 English language edition of his collection, Nocturnes, which was introduced with the statement. I write primarily for my own people they know that a chora is not a harp any more than a bellophone is a piano. Besides, it is through reaching Africans who speak French that we have the best chance of reaching Frenchmen and across seas and frontiers, the rest of men. Some might respond that the onus of understanding of Senghor's cultural references might fall on the reader. I believe, however, that Senghor understands there's a universal element to the specificity of culture the use of proper names of people and places in a poem. Why wouldn't he? He was a student of French, Greek, Latin, and algebra. He obtained the highest degree in French education. He was the first African to attain this degree. This is simply to say he knew something about seeing the universal in the literature and the aesthetics in general of other cultures. One of the more instructive traits of the poetry from these two movements is the use of time and space, which, I'm sorry, uh, how it differs and at times borrows from similar influences. Although there are a number of ways to approach the issue of temporal spatial movement in poems, I'm going to focus on four. And I'm going to say these and then I'll give them back to you again. Uh, four different types of time, uh, chronological time, sequential time, psychological time, and something I'm calling fermata, an unnatural elongation of time, space, and the previous three categories. So I'll, I'll break these down and then we'll uh, try to unpack some of these. Chronological time is a movement navigated by the clock, so to speak. Whenever a poet employs a verb tense, it becomes an attempt to ground the reader in a temporal spatial logic. Sometimes this comes through other images, images that are indicative of the movement of objects through time, seasonal change, changes from day to night, changes on an actual clock. This movement is closely related to, but not always restricted to a sequence of events. And then there's sequential time. Movement provides a logic of order in a numerical sequence, the order of directions on a map or a change in velocity, an acceleration or deceleration in speed. One might argue that a change in season or time of day can also be sequential. That is going from morning, noon to night, um, fall, winter, spring, summer. Those are all sequential ways of ordering time. And then the psychological time. Movement 
is a that movement is a bit harder to nail down. It mimics the slowness or quickness of time in our minds, which is incongruent to chronological time. Rhythm or meter can have an effect on how the mind perceives time. I'll delve into this uh, by way of example uh, in a bit, uh, but for now, understand that it can apply to chronological time and sequential time and in a more pronounced way to the formata. Um, basically, we're talking about how time feels and what it feels like to be in the midst of something. Um, you know, it's, a, it's different being in, a, in an interview um, and an hour passing there as opposed to being at a party for an hour. You know, so you might feel time and experience time in a different way. Formata. Formata is a time space movement uh, that simply feels unnatural in time or uh, indicates time that elongates or blurs temporal spatial movement. The tools of Fermata include language or imagery that does this, references to the movement of light, the idea of time being endless, time on a continuum, time periods mixing. Um, the elliptical can be Fermata. Uh, this can be applied to all the examples given earlier to achieve surreal effects. Indeed, these shifts are usually considered surreal, but not always. Sometimes that's, that's really how time works. Sometimes um, things feel timeless, uh, ongoing, uh, we're kind of left in tension. Often in our lives, we have elliptical moments, and that's that's also part of the formata. So for the chronological time, in realism, we expect that the poem to move with a pattern order in relationship to time. Another way of saying this is that we expect the actions, events, and objects in the poems to move with some relationship to time. There is usually some clear artifice used for chronological or sequential movement. This, in many ways, reinforces the suspension of disbelief in these poems, particularly if they are narrative. So it would be fair to say that if time moves in a poem realistically, it moves as it appears to move in life. Of course, it doesn't, but we get and we buy the illusion of it, whether the poem is narrative or lyrical. Langston Hughes makes a strong argument for this in the in the Weary Blues. Um, you know, I, I don't know um, if we have the ability to share screen, um, but if I if I did, uh, I don't think I, I don't think I can do this on Crowdcast. But uh, so I'll just read the poem to you all. Um, this is the Weary Blues, drowning a drowsy syncopated tune rocking back and forth to a mellow croon. I heard a Negro play down on Lenox Avenue the other night by the pale dull pallor of an old gas light. He did a lazy sway. He did a lazy sway to the tune of those weary blues with his ebony hands on each ivory key. He made that poor piano moan with melody. Old blues swaying to and fro on his rickety stool. He played that sad raggy tune like a musical fool, sweet blues coming from a black man's soul. Old blues in a deep song voice with a melancholy tone. I heard that Negro sing that old piano moan. Ain't got nobody in all this world, ain't got nobody but myself. I'm gonna quit my frowning and put my troubles on the shelf. When his foot on the floor, he played a few chords and he sang some more. I got the weary blues and I can't be satisfied got the weary blues and can't be satisfied. I ain't happy no more, and I wish that I had died. And far into the night, he crooned that tune. The stars went out and so did the moon. The singer stopped playing and went to bed while the weary blues echoed through his head. He slept like a rock or a man that's dead. There are several ways in which we can chart the use of time in the weary blues. Hughes begins the poem with two jarring verbs verbs, drowning and rocking, which might indicate that the action is taking place in the present tense. But then the narrator reveals that this is a first person account of what he heard, past tense. This changes the way we navigate the poem. That is, we expect it to sound more like a recollection as opposed to a play by play in the midst of progressive action. But we accept it without disorientation. It doesn't call for us to break the barriers of our known world to accept what we're hearing. Despite the heavy meter 
of the weary blues. It feels realistically conversational in tone because Hughes was presented, has presented the events in the poem in a linear chronological order that makes sense. This order also matches the psychological time of the poem, which I'll delve into later. For now, keep in mind the order of the action in the poem. Hughes indicates that this is past and is indeed later. And far into the night, he crooned that tune, the stars went out and so did the moon. What does this mean? The Negro played all night long, the Negro in the poem. The Negro played all night, now light, all night long until the sun came up. The narrator doesn't state this so plainly, but we understand that the stars and the moon to the naked eye are not visible during daylight. So we can surmise that chronological time has passed. In short, it makes sense and we are grounded in the moment and the progression of action, the sequential time. The singer stopped playing and went to bed, tells us a bit about the lifestyle of the singer. He works all night when most people sleep and he sleeps while most people work. Once again, the narrator doesn't say this right out, but Hughes knows the narrator doesn't have to put a fine point on it. Logic tells us this by means of what we do know about the Negro singer in the poem, that these other items are probably true. The, the, oh, the stretch in our minds isn't to understand or believe the sequence of events. The stretch in our minds is to understand the experience, what this life must be like to live. Time works chronologically and sequentially like road signs leading us to experience. Another way to look at this is as Albert Einstein has taught us, space and time are a continuum. Spatial movement is simply moving from one place to another in a poem, just moving from one place to another in a poem. You can't separate time from place and from movement. Time is always connected with this movement, the movement of place, the movement of objects or the action by objects. We understand an artifice to exist in a given time, but if we don't ground existence in a time frame, it is difficult to comprehend. Consider such a statement as the war ended 50 years ago. A child was born on March 5th. She's a Pisces. They met and fell in love 20 years ago. They got divorced last month. There's a spatial temporal movement because there's a spatial temporal relationship. Spatial temporal movement is the congruity or an incongruity of the image in the poem with the time frame in the poem. This can and should be manipulated. For instance, in film, a character that has her hand on a doorknob facing and opening the door is shot by the camera from behind. We see her actions as we would in life from the perspective of someone watching her approach a door from a comfortable distance, not from the perspective of the doorknob. And once she's opened the door, there's a cut. We now see her from the front, walking through to the other side, into a room or outside. This should take all of two to three seconds unless there's some conflict involved in walking through the doorway. This action almost, I'm sorry, this action also mimics our psychological understanding of the sequence of events needed to walk through a door. In film, this is known as matching action. If she is facing the wrong way, that is, if she is walking toward the direction she was walking away from in the previous frame, it will lack continuity. Her actions are not sequentially congruent. They simply don't match. Often I find myself suggesting to poets in workshops that they ground the reader better by ordering the time inside their poems. This is simply a polite way of saying, let's make sense. This is not fair, though, when I say that, because even when the events don't make sense, there might be a reason to accept that. This is to say that sometimes the options are not simply this or that, but something altogether unexpected. The rhythm and the tone of the poem form a synchronicity of movement. But tone and rhythm are byproducts of temporal spatial movement. Let me say that again, both tone and rhythm are byproducts of temporal spatial movement, moving through time and space. The film theorist, Sergei Eisenstein, his two volume set, Film Form and Film Sense, makes sense of this distinction in film between 
rhythmic and tonal montage. Eisenstein connects tone to emotion and connects rhythm to the internal movement from image to image in a frame. Rhythmic movement is a measure of the length, as he puts it, of images and their actions. By varying the length of imagery shot in a frame, he varied the rhythm of how it was received. So these elements are also at play in the sequential movement within the weary blues, which in turn affects the psychological time within it. And this is also found in The Deathbed by Warren Cuny. Under psychological time, uh, we'll delve into this, The Deathbed. All the time they were praying, he watched the shadow of a tree flicker on the wall. There was no need of prayer, he said, no need at all. The kinfolk thought it strange that he should ask them from a dying bed but they left all in a row and it seemed to ease him to see them go. There were some who kept on praying in a room across the hall and some who listened to the breeze that made the shadows waver on the wall. He tried his nerve on a song he knew and made an empty note that might have come from a bird's harsh throat. And all the time it worried him that they were in their praying, and all the time he wondered what it was they could be saying. So Warren Cuny sounds like no one else in the Harlem Renaissance, best known for his poem, No Images, which Nina Simone set to music and often performed in concert, and for the lyrics on the album Southern Exposure by Josh White, which is often credited with having an influence on Bob Dylan and Pete Seeger. Cuny, like a number of the Harlem Renaissance writers, came from a solid middle class background all the time, beginning of the poem. And all the time ends the poem. All the time begins the poem and all the time ends the poem. In a sense, we have an elongation of time, the fermata, but we also have a sense of an enduring of time, which feels natural to the circumstances at hand. It doesn't feel good to lie in bed on your deathbed and having people pray over you. So the, the way time works is that time seems to slow down and you're enduring it. And what about the movement through space? Do we stay in the bedroom? They left all in a row in the case that people came in the room and they left the room. Maybe they came together and left together. Maybe they came in tandem and left in tandem. Either way, people came, which took time, and people left, which took time. And there's the issue of where the narrator is. The narrator's locus in perspective and the action of the poem. Does he speak from an afterlife? Does he speak from a dying life still alive in the bed? The answers will vary depending on perspective relative to the position of the reader. I've heard many different interpretations of where the speaker is or who the speaker is in that moment. Um, they, I think they're all right. Uh, Hughes also employs a psychological use of time in the weary blues, and it's the psychological movement of time that pushes us closer to the fantastic, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Like I said, time moves in the weary blues as if it were a realistic time, but of course it doesn't and it can't. But how many times have we been at a party and realized, much to our surprise, that it was an hour or two later than we thought? Time often moves faster or slower in our minds uh, than it does in real time. Um, okay, so I have a, a writing exercise, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, I'll, I'll just skip ahead. Um, so uh, one, of the, um, one of the great craft books uh, is a book by uh, Mario Vargas Llosa, a Peruvian novelist, uh, Letters to a Young Novelist, which is uh, you know, kind of a riff off of Rilke. Uh, he explains this aptly in literary terms. He says, I assure you that it is the rule that time in the novel is based not on chronological time, but on psychological time, a subjective time to which the novelist is able to give the appearance of objectivity, thereby setting the novel apart from the real world. And so in that quote, we can substitute poet for novelist and poem for novel to see that Hughes has replicated this phenomenon in the weary blues. The poem is not based on chronological time, but on psychological time. 
the night moves quickly. I'm sorry. Yeah, the night moves quickly because activity and play are both at hand. The synchronicity of senses is at play in the poem. But by the end, we know that this Negro singer has had a long night. In a sense, psychological time is an illusion of chronological time. If we want to prolong an experience, time moves more easily and pleasurably. If we don't, time moves more slowly and less enjoyably. But like the speed of light, time also has a constant. There does exist a proper time, so to speak, one that isn't contorted for our benefit, that continues to move while we pretend to be younger than we are, or that we age within. Hughes has captured the psychology of how we experience time in the weary blues by using chronological and sequential clues to guide us. He doesn't have to say, and we were having a good, a good time and lost track of time, no more than we needed to see the woman in the film complete the action of walking through a door. It's understood and implied through the con to, from the congruity of how the chronology and sequence of time matches the psychology of the situation in the poem. This forms a constellation that grounds the reader in its realism. With Fermata, there's a good deal of lyric poetry and works from the Harlem Renaissance as well as the Negritude movement. Hughes and Cuny both were masters of the lyric poem. Cuny was actually a trained musician and scholar of music theory, which he parlayed into the music of his poems. This is no small wonder. The temporal movement of lyrical poetry is imitative, a temporal movement in music. But this is more pronounced in work from the Negritude movement once surrealism is infused into it. Certainly, we can talk about the music in the weary blues, but it doesn't fully explain the effect of time on the content of the poem. It simply is a way to put into words the sequence, meter, and rhythm of the poem. Warren Cuny places the voice navigating time in the third person, so the deathbed contains two times, the time of the events as they happen and the time of the telling of the recollection which extends time in a natural manner, a manner we're used to experiencing. For this reason, I want to use a musical term, fermata, to describe this movement. This term loosely means a prolongation of time in music. Sometimes this is something that can be uh, noted, and there's a, a notation for it. And sometimes, particularly in jazz, it is not. When musicians would show up for recording sessions with Charlie Mingus, uh, they, uh, Danny Richman on drums or Jimmy Napper on trombone in particular, would talk about how much of the feel of the music was never on the sheet music. Sometimes the swing or the blowing of a note won't be on the sheet music, but in the musician. As a result, the music sounds unorthodox to the ear of someone wedded to the page, but the emotion of it, psychologically familiar. That is to say, we understand the emotion behind it. In these negritude poems, time is distended in unorthodox or unnatural ways, not in ways imitative of real time, not in ways imitative of how we psychologically manipulate time, but in ways around which we cannot wrap our minds. Um, so I'm going to read some excerpts from Elegy of Midnight. Um, at the time, I thought I was able to show you all these, but I'm just going to read them and I'll, I'll move around a little bit. Um, this is Elegy of Midnight, a beautiful Leopold Sangor poem. Summer, splendid summer, feeding the poet with the milk of your light. In my eyes, the Portuguese lighthouse turned, yes, 24 hours out of 24. A machine precise and unrelenting until the end of time. I leap out of my bed, a leopard in the snare, a sudden gust of simoon sand up my throat. Ah, if I could crumble into the dung and blood, into the void, I pace among my books. They gaze at me from the bottoms of their eyes. 6,000 lamps burning 24 hours out of 24. I am standing up, strangely lucid, and I am handsome as the hundred yards runner, as the black Mauritanian stallion in rut. I wash down in my blood a river of seed to make fertile all the Byzantine plains and the hills, the austere hills. I am the lover 
and the locomotive with well-oiled piston. The pain of living, dying of not dying, the agony of darkness, that passion of death and light. Light moves at 186,000 miles per second, always. It's a constant. The thought of doubling or doubling it or cubing it is simply beyond our scope because we can't imagine anything in our natural world moving at that speed. The word light, the phrase 24 hours out of 24, a time within time we use associatively as a language to guide us, the road signs, the props in the scene to accept the images in the poem. In LG of Midnight, time now works as more than a structural device in the poem. The movement of time is so content and the, and the content is quite unnatural. There are natural elements, but they are, uh, they are not used or combined in natural ways. Surprise is a tool of surrealism. So how does this work in the poem? There is continuity even in the surprise. Time is distended through concrete imagery that represents incomprehensible time. It's not that 24 hours out of 24 doesn't make sense. We're not taken out of the poem by this because it is congruent with the images of the poem. The movement of light in that lighthouse, which we cannot comprehend but witness. We're not taken out of the poem by the theme, an elegy for midnight, which stands in for darkness, which stands in for the unknown or the death of midnight. That is a stand in for the death of renewal. And we're not taken out of the poem by the language 24 hours out of 24, which offers a common measure of time we accept as the course of a day. But now it offers the surprise of trying to consider a day as we know it, that is, occurring within a movement. Everything is complete. Iconography catches us off guard. The symbols, language, and themes catch us off guard uh, consistently. Nonsense in the real world, but there is matching action in the poem. Once again, we understand the emotion contained in the poem. We put a finger on the intangible. Senghor's contemporary and friend, Amé Césaire, takes a similar approach toward making the intangible palpably clear in its incendiary word, translated by Clayton Eshelman, which delves into the emotion that's conjured from the utterance of the racial epithet, nigger, word. Within me, from myself to myself, outside any constellation, clenched in my hands only the rare hiccup of an ultimate raving spasm. Keep vibrating, word. And let me be nailed by all the arrows and their bitterest curare to the beautiful center stake of very cool stars, vibrate, Vibrate you very essence of the dark in a wing, in a throat, from so much perishing, the word nigger emerge fully formed from the howling of a poisonous flower, the word nigger all filthy with parasites, the word nigger loaded with roaming bandits. Uh, so those are excerpts from that poem. The, the poem is much longer. Uh, I started with lines one through seven and I finished with lines 13 through, through 25. The sequence of this temporal spatial journey is stretched across an emotional terrain. Césaire manipulates the point of view and consequently directs speaker's perspective according to relativity. That is to say the speaker's emotions are moored to the perspective from which the speaker experiences the utterance of nigger. The amount of time it takes to utter two syllables. The Oxford English Dictionary the fifth edition and Miriam Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, 11th edition, scan nigger with stress on the first syllable, making it a trochee. Dictionary.com scans the word as an I am. Nonetheless, I doubt if any African American born before 1970 hears it as anything other than a spondy, which signifies a stress that does not let up in intensity. Here, the relativity of race and age factor into the sonic qualities of how the word nigger is received in the ear. Césaire sustains the, um, the moment of utterance over permutations of the words locus, which consequently stretches the word over time, the elongation of time, its echo, so to speak, once received by the listener, mimics the motivation. 
of the word in the ear of one experienced with its carare. Césaire's use of fermata takes a surrealistic tone in order to convey a realistic experiencing of the word. This is why poetry is like physics without the math. Instead of the language of mathematics, we use the language of words to make sense of that which we cannot see, of how matter and the immaterial work. Math is used to explain physical laws and poetry is used similarly to render them visible. That makes poetry a universal and language as math and we should wield it as such. I no longer believe that the aesthetics of a poem or the background of a poet or even a literary movement determine the audience for a poem. The poem speaks to those who can hear its many frequencies echoing over time. Sometimes these are predetermined and sometimes the poem teaches us this as we go along and follow its logic. When someone tells me they see or feel or understand elements in a poem I've written, things I know nothing about, things I've not thought about, I have in my mind written about, I often buy it. I can try to make sense of the movement of elements in the poem, but sometimes this is beyond my scope. I simply know when things don't match. This doesn't mean that I write without any idea of what the poem is about, but it does mean that I may not hold all the answers in my hand. And I don't worry about the poem being timeless, only that it makes sense in its present time and contains some of the time's iconography, that a poem arrives in the future, carrying some of the meaning of its past is enough. So that's that's it for the writing part of it. Um, but if um, folks have questions, I think we still have uh, about fifteen minutes, a little less, for that. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Van. Um, if folks have questions, please put them in the question text box, which you can see on your left hand side with the plus symbol. Um, Salim asks name. Name the author of the most recent poem just quoted, Amy Césaire. That was just correct. Yeah. Honoré Gattis on that one. Yeah. Um, when you, Honoré asks, when you unpack the four times of time, could you spell the last version of the time you mentioned? I believe it was Fermata, correct? Yeah. Spelled yes. F-E-R. I'll put it one more time in the chat. F-E-R-M-A-T-A, Fermata. Mm -hmm. um, I can draw the symbol. Uh, it's like it looks like a this is like an eyeball, you know. So that's what the that's what the symbol looks like over a sheet over sheet music, and it's just um, it's really like if you were playing if you were playing music, you would look at the conductor. Mm -hmm. and the conductor would like tell you like when you when the, uh, how long to hold that note or to hold that phrase, you know. So it's like an elongation of time, that, you know. So like in music, you know, time is so important. You know the meter is so important, but um, when you have a fermata, it's kind of it, it just it goes to feel. So that's what that's about. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see a lot of questions, but I think I'll just ask a question for myself as as someone who is a who is a student of poetics. I'm curious about in your passage you were talking about how the poets aren't so much interested in being timeless, but making sense in their own time frame. Um, for us poets who are operating and writing right now, um, is that idea of being timeless something that could be a hindrance to the poem um, operating in its own time space? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that I don't think that it's um, it's a bad ambition. It's just mm -hmm. that I think that people are trying to speak to people in the here and the now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a certain urgency in that work that we've been reading that I was just reading from, and I feel that urgency in the in the work. And, um, you know, I could be naive, but I, I don't feel what I'm reading, when I'm reading cues or if I'm reading Senghor or Césaire, Cuny, um, any one of those writers, I, I don't feel like they're, they're thinking, oh, this is going to be a timeless piece of art. I'm about to, you know what I mean? I feel like they're trying to speak to something that's, uh, that has a certain urgency at the time, but you know, because it's dealing with the human condition, that alone will make it timeless, mm -hmm. you know, because the human condition is something that is kind of beyond time um, and ongoing and, and a, on a cycle. So, um, you know, I think worrying about 
um, being concerned with, maybe better put, about um, the urgency to get this out mm -hmm. is, uh, is more important than thinking about timelessness. Mm -hmm. You know, other people and time itself will take care of that for you. So no need to worry about it. Absolutely. Uh, Loretta had a really great question here in the chat. Name The name of the author in the book that you referenced as being one of the best craft books for writing? That I referenced? Yes. In this talk, I did? I believe, yeah, I believe that's what you mean, right, Loretta? You can oh, also oh, mm -hmm. Mario Vargas Llosa. Mario, I'll put that in the chat for folks. Yeah, I, I, maybe I can do it too. Uh, Let yeah. us for young novelists. Wonderful, thank you, Celine. Yeah, he's 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 a, a brilliant novelist, uh, but he writes about craft really well. And that book is insanely beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, he so in that book he has a whole chapter on time, and he's he's the one I, I kind of look to for that breakdown of uh, the elements of time. You know, um, he's he goes deeper than that. Like he has like other levels of it. I, I just use those four. I, I, I should probably also say that when it comes to like breaking it down that way, you can't isolate those those elements. Like you can't just say, oh, this poem is operating on chronological time or this poem is operating on psychological time. It's always going to be uh, a, a, a combination of those at play at one time. And, you know, like I said at the beginning, you know, it's stuff that we know, like we know verb tense, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? We know the sequence of the days of the week and, and the you know the time of day. It's a matter of thinking about it more purposefully and thinking like how can I use this and actually apply it. Um, you know, because often when we're in a poem and we're in the process of revision and things aren't quite you know adding up, it's something usually something as simple as okay, let's think about the logic of time right now. How is this working? You know, where's your, you know, where's your verb tense? Um, how is it shifting here? Where are we now? You know, just asking basic questions. Um, sometimes that's enough. And it's, you know, it's, that goes with the writing of the poem and also for the reading of the poem. Like, you know, when you're reading a poem and sometimes you're trying to make sense of it, that's another way of looking at it. Like, let's, let's, let's try to do that, approach it from the perspective of just looking at it through a lens of time. Wonderful. Uh, Luther Hughes has an amazing question um, here. I'm curious about the relationships between multiple times, like psychological and sequential, that can appear urgent, especially when thinking about timelessness. What is the relationship between being timeless and balancing the relationship between different types of time and urgency? And let me know if you need me to reread it for you. Um, say the last part about time, being timeless and what? What is your relationship between being timeless, mm -hmm. and balancing the relationship between types of time and urgency? I'll also put it in the chat that way you and everyone else can can see it. Yeah. So I, you know, for me, I think if I'm if I'm understanding the question, mm -hmm. if I'm understanding the question. I would say that um, I I wouldn't worry about trying to be timeless mm -hmm. while you're in the middle of writing a poem. Mm -hmm. You know. I think you need to worry about saying something with some urgency, right? You know, and and then that kind of timelessness will take care of itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I mean, that's for me. I I know I wouldn't be able to write if I was thinking, you know, I'm trying to write something that's going to be timeless right now. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. um, for me, I think if I'm if I'm approaching the page from a perspective of thinking about what is what is urgent to me right now? What is the conversation I'm trying to have with the world? This is the, the question I ask in my workshop a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what 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 conversation am I trying to have with the world right now? Why do I want to say this? Why, why do I feel like this has to be in a poem? Why, why am I not writing an essay about it? Mm -hmm. You know, why haven't I taken the social media, not that I'm on social media, but why haven't I taken the social media about it? You know, mm -hmm. something like that. Why am I doing this in a poem? So that in itself, the act that I'm sitting down to write a poem 
it's a certain urgency there. And that's, that's where the timelessness comes in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe a more succinct way to get at the question. I think that you got at the question, but also uh, regarding urgency, um, how does, hmm, I'm also trying to get at Salim's question. What, what might it look like to have urgency in each four of these types of poem, these types of time in a poem? Um, so maybe, and let me know Luther or Salim if I'm off base, but how does urgency, because all poems in one way or another are governed by a sense of urgency, right? Yeah, yeah. How does, for more or less, um, it might have different names or faces, but how does urgency affect, uh, yeah, how does urgency affect timelessness or timeliness or what might it look like to go back to Salim's question? What might it look like to have urgency in each four of these different times in a poem, for example? So I'll use an example that I used yesterday in my class, in my workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a poem that a lot of us know, um, particularly since my, I don't have the, the screen share here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, those winter Sundays. Robert Hayden, right? Mm -hmm. so those Wonder Sundays, you know, it's a poem that's kind of quiet, you know, pacing wise, it, you might, you, and, and, and tone wise, we might say that, that it's kind of meditative. But uh, thank you for putting that up there, my man, Celine, on the, on the, on it. Uh, now, so you, so you know, um, you know, you, you have that poem. It's got this kind of meditative tone, but the urgency in the poem is the is the fact that the speaker understands his father. He finally mm -hmm. understands his father. Like, you know, he's been mm -hmm. his whole life watching his father, you know, winners getting up on Sundays, you know, making the fire, polishing his shoes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can tell in the poem that there's time that's passed. Mm -hmm. So the that's poem wasn't written in you know, present progressive. It's not like he's 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 polishing my shoes. He's making a fire. It's like he did these things. Yeah. And so now the recollection. He's he's standing there in reverie years later, and suddenly it makes sense. That's what love looks like. That was my father's love language. You know, what did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lowly offices? You know, so he gets it there. Yeah. Yes, honoré, you know, so, you know, so there it is. Um, it's, it's the, like she says here, it's the emotional urgency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think we have time for these last two questions in uh, the text box. Van, uh, this is also from honoré. Van, how would you characterize which time category the blues falls into, or can it fall into all four? Which, which falls into? Um, how how would you categorize which time category the blues falls into, or can it be all four? It can be all four, definitely. You know, and the and, um, y'all if y'all don't know, that's Honoré Jeffers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's the master of the blues poem and uh, master poet. Period. And so, you know, like with the blues. Um, you know, time is important. Like chronological time, I should say, is important. And then the feel, the, the psychology of it, the how, the emotion of it, mm -hmm. you know. And then, um, you know, the sequence. Like, you know, you have your, your statement, you have your variation on the statement, and then you have, I call that last part transcendence, but you mm -hmm. have the part where it's a certain resolution, a certain address, a coping me mechanism, um, there's some way that 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 issue is being coped with and managed. Um, and so there's a sequence involved. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the supernatural comes into the blues all the time. So you can have the fermata, you know, things don't always work out. That's fermata too, that's good because it can be elliptical. You know, so there are all kinds of ways of, uh, <laughs> all kinds of ways of, of dealing with it. She's talking about people. <laughs> y'all look, y'all look on her up and see if I'm gassing her up. Y'all look her up. The gassing up is much deserved. This is our last question for the evening. Um, again, from Loretta. Thank you, Loretta. How does the four dimensions of time that you have discussed relate to writing and self-awareness of African Americans in light of the most offensive word, the N-word? Um, because I was born in 49, as Loretta says. 
that was what is let me put, let me put this in the text box and i'll try to like maybe distill the question a little bit better how does the four dimen the four dimensions of time that you have discussed mm -hmm. relate to writing and self-awareness of black people as we kind of recontextualize mm -hmm. the n-word to become a word more of camaraderie than of its violent past is that close to your question loretta I think maybe maybe another way to get at Loretta's question is that how do the four dimensions of time um, that you've discussed change or shift language over time? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I think if I understand the question, I, I think uh, I, I'll I'll answer that mm -hmm. just personally because I can't speak to that um, uh, beyond beyond the personal. Like for me, um, I know growing up. Um, you know, the N word was something that was used. You know, I, I would I would use it. My friends would use it. We, you know, you go in a barbershop, it would come up and you in the house in the household it would come up. And it was like what linguists call um in-group speak. Like that was something that we used among ourselves um in a certain vernacular, mm -hmm. right? Um and you know, I think for me, you know, I've never been, I'm never going to be comfortable with, like hearing someone white say it, you know, and um, so over time, that's never changed for me. So that's almost like, I mean, if I could, if I have to put it in, in that category, like this is like academic right now, like we're talking about it through this kind of lens, but if I had to put it in the category, it's like fermata because it's, it's always the same to me, it always feels the same to me. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it always uh, is discordant when I hear it. It, it you know, uh, I'm going to be mad when I hear it from somebody white. Um, I'm going to be mad if someone black use it in mixed company. You know, so it's it's just the way it is. You know, um, so that hasn't changed. But um, I think that, I think the country's relationship to it has changed. You know, I think some of that's um, you know commercialization of hip hop. You know, and, and having young um, uh, young people, white uh, teens, you know, uh, listening to and singing lyrics to hip hop. Mm -hmm. You know, like um, when I was listening to hip hop when I was a kid, it wasn't commercial. Like it wasn't on the radio. You know, um, there was still it wasn't any urban music categories. It was black music. You know, what I mean, and so it was um, it was a very different experience with with the word, very different experience of how the word was being used in popular culture. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, I guess I'm just locked in time in that way because it hasn't changed for me. Thank you so much, Ben, for this really wonderful and amazing and fruitful uh, conversation. Um, I want to thank so much everyone who came in, our participants as well as outside guests. We have another um, we have another craft talk coming up with the one and only Trisha Elam Walker, which will be happening later in the week. Um, thank you all so much again for tuning in. We hope to see you so much at the at the next craft talk, and you all have a good evening. Thank you.